last week of this course on acoustic materials and metamaterials and today is lecture number 36. So, so far we have been discussing about sonic crystals and before we begin to understand how do the sonic crystals work, I went through the fundamentals of the crystal theory because that is important in understanding why there is a sound attenuation in sonic crystals. So, we studied about some of the concepts like what are the <coughs> lattice vectors, what is a direct lattice, what is a reciprocal lattice and then what is a Brillouin zone and what is an irreducible Brillouin zone. So, in this particular lecture we will continue with the discussion on the irreducible Brillouin zone and then based on that I will tell you what is the working principle of sonic crystals and then sonic crystals they work on two particular principles. So, in this lecture we will discuss the first principle which is the wave spectral gap or the band gap in periodic structures and then we will go through a special theorem called as the Bloch's theorem. Okay. So, based on the discussion on the last class uh, about irreducible Brillouin zone, we know that when we have a reciprocal lattice then we can take a primary uh, unit, a primary repeating unit. So, we can select one lattice point and find out the volume of space that is closer to that lattice point compared to any other adjacent lattice points. So, when you get that, that volume of space becomes the Brillouin zone and that is the <coughs> unique space and if we know the information of wave propagation in that space, we can predict the wave propagation in the entire crystal. But the Brillouin zone itself can have some symmetry. So, when all the symmetry is removed, the non-symmetrical basic unit left is called as the irreducible Brillouin zone. So, let us discuss some examples here. So, a 2D reciprocal square lattice is given. So, now we know that for a square lattice the reciprocal itself will be a square lattice. So, this is the reciprocal lattice and this is the lattice point about which we have to define a Brillouin zone and these are the various lattice vectors. So, how do you begin? So, let me uh, say that the adjacent points next to this are this, 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 this. So, all these are the adjacent points next to this particular lattice point. So, let us say find out the volume of find out that area within which the points are closer to this one compared to this particular point. So, if we draw a line here in the midpoint between the two. So, this is the midpoint so, this is the line joining the two centers and this is the midpoint. So, if you draw a line here then all the points which lie within this line will be closer to this lattice point compared to this lattice point. Similarly, let us <coughs> see what happens for this one for this particular lattice point. Again if we draw a line here which is at the midpoint between the two lattice points then all the lie and then all the points which lie in this direction nearer to this uh, <coughs> between the between the prime lattice point about which we are defining the Brillouin zone and the line then all these points they will be closer to this compared to this and the same way we can continue and we can keep drawing lines for every adjacent point. So, for this one this is the line and all the points that are in this direction are closer to this compared to this one. So, they are closer to the prime lattice point. Similarly, for this one again the Brillouin zone must contain the points within this zone which is a square. Now, let us also cross check with the other diagonal lattice points. So, if we say what should be the points which are closer to this one the primary lattice point about which we are defining the Brillouin zone and they are closer to this one compared to its diagonal neighbor. So, if we draw up again a line that is the perpendicular bisector of the line joining the center. So, all these lines are the perpendicular bisector between the two centers. Then all of this point that is within this will be a part of the Brillouin zone and so on we can continue for this point, for this point, for this point. So, for every point one by one we are drawing what is that zone of area where 
the uh, the the zone of area which is closer where the points they are closer to the primary lattice vector compared to the point to the adjacent neighbor so when we reduce this we get this volume of space so this volume of space equals to all that area so here it is a two dimensional lattice so i am taking area when it was a three dimensional the same concept applies to the volume so that area or the volume within which that is closer to this particular lattice point compared to any other adjacent point so this becomes the bruluvian zone so this is how we have found the bz now the bruluvian zone itself has symmetry so let's say if we take a axis here then the top portion is symmetrical to the bottom portion so which means we can rem we can only find the solution in this space the top space and replicate it in the bottom and we can get the whole solution so we can reduce this space further now we have a reduced space does it have a symmetry about this vertical axis if you see yes there is a symmetry about the vertical axis then you can again <coughs> only find the solution in one of these portions let's say this one and remove this so once you get the solution within this portion this particular sec section then you can first reflect it about the vertical axis and then the total solution can be reflected about the x axis to get the full solution the full wave solution now this is the zone we have left with do we have any further symmetry so if you see if you draw our line here this one then this portion can be reflected about this xy plane that is 45 degrees so xy axis and they are symmetrical to each other so the final zone i am left with i can choose either one of it so this is the final zone that i am left with so this becomes the irreducible bruluvian zone which means the bruluvian zone which cannot be reduced further into more such sections of symmetry so as you can see you cannot do a section here this cannot be done why because he, the bruluvian zone and irreducible bruluvian zone by their definition must have the center at the lattice so they must have the lattice point and this one does not contain a lattice point so this is not symmetrical about these two sections and so on so if i just erase this thing again it was just to explain to you so finally what we are left with we are left with this particular portion which is the the finest or the smallest area where if we find the wave solution we can keep replicating it or using various symmetrical operations to create the solution for the entire crystal let us see another example to make this concept clear so let's say now we have a two dimensional reciprocal lattice for a reciprocal horizontal lattice so this is their horiz horizontally so sort of spaced and let's say this is the so you can for when you're defining a bruluvian zone you can choose any one lattice point because it is sort of a very large array not infinite but a large a very large array and there are lots of lattice points so you can choose any one lattice point and then define the bruluvian zone about that lattice point so here i'm choosing this particular one and these are the primary lattice vectors so now i have to find that region of area where the points they are closest to this one compared to all its adjacent neighbors so these are the adjacent neighbors and we have to find the points which is closest to this one compared to the next neighbors so let's start with <coughs> one of it so if i start with this one again i'm drawing a line which is a perpendicular bisector of the this line joining the centers between the two so this will pass because this is a regular hexagon so this will pass through the centers of the hexagon these two hexagons because of the regular hexagons so all the points that lie nearer at this end of the line all these points they will be closer to this one compared to this one similarly let's say now i have i want to look at one of the other ones so let's say i want to look at this one so again i draw the same with the same concept i draw a perpendicular bisector along the line joining the centers for the two points under consideration and all the points within this will be closer to this particular point compared to this one the outside one and similarly for this one what will be the line like it will be like this and these should be the points similarly for this one 
again all the points lying on this side of the line would be closer to this particular central lattice point compared to the outside one. Similarly, now we take this one then perpendicular bisector for this center will pass through this one and this these should be the points. And finally, so all these it has 6 adjacent neighbors. So, 1 by 1 for every adjacent lattice point we are finding out we are joining that we are joining the lattice point about which we have to define the zone. So, we are joining the center of that lattice point with the center of its nearest neighbor. We are drawing a perpendicular bisector then all the points on the on the others on the inner side of the perpendicular bisector will be the points which lie closer to the lattice point about which we have to define the Brillouin zone. So, so on and so forth finally, the last neighbor I have considered. So, one by one I have considered all 6 neighbors and the intersection of this is this zone here. So, this zone is the intersection. So, all the points here they are closest to this lattice point compared to any of the other adjacent lattice points. So, this becomes by definition the Brillouin zone. So, this is what is a Brillouin zone. So, for a hexagon the Brillouin zone itself is a hexagon. Now, as you see for a square lattice what we saw was that it was on a, it was again a square, but the square was of the same side with the same lattice constant, but here this is a reduced hexagon. Now, let us see so, now this is a, a prime unit cell about which we can find some solutions and we can repeat it to get the solution for the entire lattice. So, this repeating unit can be repeated in all the directions to get for the solution for the entire lattice, but we can reduce our computation time further by reducing this zone further and further. So, let us start with this particular axis. So, here this portion is symmetrical about this, so which means we can reduce it one step further we can only find the solution in one of this one of these portions and then when we reflect this result about this axis we will get for the full zone. Let us see if we have more symmetry. So, let us see the axis here. So, here we have this entire zone we can divide it into 3 equilateral triangles. <clears throat> so, if we choose any one equilateral triangle here then we can reflect it about this point and then we can reflect this about this point and so on and we can if we get the answer in any one of this let us say in this one or any one of this then we can find out then this then due to by reflecting it about the respective axis. So, using these symmetrical operations what we can get we can get the solution for the entire zone. So, we have reduced it into 3 symmetrical portions. So, we are retaining only one portion. So, if we find the, so here as you can see if we find the solution only in this area then we can replicate it to get for the entire Brillouin zone. Can it be reduced further? Yes, it can. So, you, you draw a line about this, retain one of the portion. So, now, this cannot be reduced any further. So, this becomes the irreducible Brillouin zone. So, the minimum the minimum area till which we can reduce it beyond which we cannot reduce. So, now if we know, so when we solve the when we solve the equations for the entire crystal instead of solving the wave equation for the entire crystals we can simply find what is the Brillouin zone, what is the irreducible Brillouin zone, this is the short form for this. So, what is the IBZ, when we find the IBZ we only find the solution about this and then we keep reflecting it using some symmetrical operations and we can get for the entire Brillouin zone and this Brillouin zone can, can, can be further translated and tra <coughs> translated about the different uh, lattice vectors to get the answer for the entire crystal. So, that was the purpose of using an IBZ which is because the knowledge of wave propagation through this IBZ is sufficient enough to understand the wave propagation through the entire crystals. Thus, we just by knowing what is the kind of wave propagation happening within this small zone, we can know what is the wave propagation through the entire crystal and we can replicate the results using some symmetrical operations. So, this is a 2D view, this is a uh, sorry this is a 3D view, this is a 3D crystal and there, there is some irreducible Brillouin zone obtained, we can only obtain the results here and then we can replicate to get the knowledge for the entire crystal.
So, this effectively reduces the computation time a lot. Now, what has been found empirically and out of lots and lots of experiments is that that the extremes of the frequency bands they only occur at the key points of symmetry of the blue-in zone. So, if we can reduce the computation even further. So, instead of finding the solution for every point within the full volume of the IBZ, we can just go along the perimeter of IBZ and calculate the values at the perimeter points and that will give us the all the extremes. So, because the extremities they are occurring at these along the parameter or the key points of symmetry. So, just translating the parameter, the perimeter can give you a good enough idea of how the wave is propagating and you can find out what are the frequencies within which there is no wave propagation. So, when we do this, so the further reduction can be that let us say we have the hexagonal lattice and this is the irreducible blue in zone we obtained. So, instead of finding the solutions for every point within this area, we can just find the solutions within the peri perimeter. So, only along the perimeter points if we find the solution, then we can <coughs> get a good enough idea of what is happening in the entire crystal. So, here, so the way frequency response for sonic crystals is represented is that we represent vertical axis becomes the frequency and this becomes the uh, perimeter of the IBZ. So, here the direction in which I have started is tau. So, from tau to k, k to m, m to tau. So, this is how th the entire perimeter has been translated and represented here in a scaled manner. So, this tau m will be proportional to this distance, k m will be proportional to this distance and m t will be proportional to this. So, as you can see these two points are closer. So, they are closer here. So, it is proportionately divided and a linear scale is created. So, my idea of telling you about uh, the Bruin zones and the irreducible Bruin zone was to make you understand that in any periodic structure be it a sonic crystal or a natural crystal. So, both artificial and natural crystals you can simply find how the frequency is propagating. So, for that first of all to find as I told you that the actual information is in the is the actual wave is as a variation of time and space. But if you want to find out the frequency component or the frequency uh, <coughs> how the frequencies propagate then first of all you represent the crystal in the reciprocal space that will give you that what are the various frequencies. So, instead of space and time now you get in frequency and wave numbers. And then after that, so once you have represented in reciprocal space, then you can find the smallest element of symmetry and along that parameter you can find out what is the wave propagation like and this will give you a idea of what how the propagation is taking place in the crystals and what are the directions where the wave propagation is highest for which frequencies it is highest and for which frequencies there are no wave propagation. So, this is a typical band diagram. So, the typical band diagram this is the vertical and the horizontal axis. So, this is how the sonic crystals are represented. Similarly, for if we have a square lattice. So, say let us say we have sonic scatterers arranged in a square lattice. This becomes the IBZ. We can represent it. So, the horizontal axis will become here. So, here you can you can go in any direction whether you go in this direction or the other direction the information is going to be the same. So, you translate throughout the parameter and you represent it uh, in this is the perimeter and this is the frequency. Okay. And similarly for this 3D lattice again you can have the frequency and then you can represent the perimeter for this zone. So, here you can see that these are the key points tau, l, k, w, u and x and I would like to point out here that for ease in calculations now we have some standard crystals like for example, for sonic crystals usually a square lattice or a hexagonal lattice is used. So, for every such lattice you can there, there are some standard tables of key points for different lattices. So, if you know what is the lattice structure like 
and what are the lattice constants like or what is the distance between the different lattice points. <coughs> then there are some standard tables available to you where you can you will already know that this is a complicate this is a lattice this is a particular crystal type for this this is the reciprocal lattice then for this reciprocal lattice what will be the key points. So, you will you can find so this values can also be obtained from the standard table. So, once you know these values you will know these distances and you can plot it in the horizontal axis. So, that is how the data is represented obviously in this particular course you will not be asked or you will not you will not be learning how to exactly use those tables and draw those diagrams. This is just to give you an idea of how the band diagrams are made for various sonic crystals and what do they represent. So, now we have covered this. So, let us go into what is the principle of working of the sonic crystals and as I said before sonic crystals they are used either for attenuating sound or for bending of the sound waves where they act as a very strong reflector and they can reflect the sound waves. And they work on two main principles. The first principle is the classical wave spectral gap in structures with periodic variations in elastic properties. So, as I told you sonic crystals are what they are periodic array of sonic scatterers in some fluid medium. So, they behave as if they are a periodic structure and their elastic properties which means their bulk modulus and density keep varying periodically in the different directions. So, in such kind of structures a, a typical frequency gap is created and we will study about this principle in today's lecture. The second principle about which they work is that at certain frequencies local resonance can be set up which can lead to negative effective elastic properties. And we already know what happens when we have a negative density or a negative bulk modulus. The sound attenuation happens or the propagation stops. So, these are the two principles. So, let us go through the first principle which is the wave spectral gap or the formation of band gap in periodic structures. So, in this concept, so what does it state is that if you have a strong periodic modulation in either the density or the bulk modulus. So, we know that for acoustic waves this bulk modulus and the density are the key elastic properties which determine wave propagation. So, if we are able to create a structure where this B value either B value or rho value or sometimes both they vary periodically in the structure. Then that structure can create some spectral gaps of frequency bands and in those frequency bands no wave propagates to the structure. So, a complete sound attenuation way at a certain frequency range can be achieved and for this to happen one of the key condition and I will explain to you why this happens we will study about Bloch's theorem next. But for this concept to be valid that in the periodic structures due to the periodicity or the periodic modulation of B or rho there is a, we get some frequency bands within which no wave propagation is taking place. But for this concept to be true the spatial modulation or the spatial period it must be of the same order of magnitude as the wavelength in the spectral gaps. So, this is and this will become more clear later when we study about the limitations of the sonic crystals, but what it means is that let us say we have a sonic crystal let us say the dia it is made up of aluminum cylinders and the diameter is 5 centimeters and they are spaced apart. <clears throat> so, the distance between the two centers is let us say 10 centimeters. So, here all the dimensions are like or the order of 5 centimeters, 10 centimeters and so on. So, in that case this kind of array of sonic crystal will only be able to reduce the it will only work. So, here a gap between a, a frequency gap can only be created in the order of its wavelength. So, let us say if uh, the <clears throat> dimension the spatial modulation which is which means that the dimension of the uh, diameter of this aluminum cylinder and the spacing between the aluminum cylinder. So, we have some 2D aluminum cylinders arranged in a certain way and they are of the order of 10 centimeter. 
So, what is the frequency corresponding to a wavelength of 10 centimeter? It is going to be 340 divided by 0 0.1 sorry point 0 it will be 0 0.1. So, it will be 3400 hertz. So, which means that this structure is no good for frequencies of the order less than 3400 hertz. So, the gap will only be created when the wavelength is of the same order as the uh, dimensions of periodicity within the arrangement of the sonic crystal. Now, how does this happen? Why do periodic modulation lead to this frequency gap? So, this is explained by a theorem called as the Bloch's theorem. So, in the Bloch's theorem what happens? So, here the acoustic this theorem states and the derivation of this theorem is out of course for this particular it is out of scope in this particular course. So, I am directly stating what is the Bloch's theorem and it is taken from electromagnetic theory. So, here whatever acoustic field is generated in a periodic structure it will take the same symmetry and periodicity as that of the structure itself. So, if we have some periodic structure then the waves that are created in this periodic structures are also called as the Bloch waves because they are governed by Bloch's theorem. And the typical waveform is this is the typical waveform equation of this which means that. So, here the acoustic pressure is some function of amplitude into e to the power j k into r. So, this is the term which is similar to a plane wave like term, but the amplitude term is a periodic term. So, amplitude varies periodically. So, let us say we have a sonic crystal and the lattice constant or the distance between this is the lattice vector. Now, lattice vector can give you the idea of two different quantities. The first one is that if you take the mod of lattice vector what you will get is the magnitude of the distance between any two scatterers. So, the distance between any two adjacent centers of the scatterers. So, that will be the magnitude and the direction of the lattice lattice vector gives you the direction in which there is periodicity. So, you get both the magnitude between the the you can say the magnitude of the spacing between the scatterers and uh, the spacing here being the distance between the centers of the scatterer and it can also give you what is the direction of periodicity. So, when so this amplitude is a function of this lattice constant. So, which means that it keeps repeating with the same value. So, this is a periodic variation. So, if I give you two such diagrams. So, let us say a plane wave front is incident and this is the arrangement of the sonic crystals. So, what has been found this is a simulation study and it is found that the wave pattern it has similar nature or similar periodicity as the periodicity of the crystals. So, as you can see the distance between this and this will be same as the distance between this and this. So, this and this will be same. So, that is what is meant by it and similarly here we have a plane wave front incident in this direction. So, in this direction this is the periodicity. So, they this is the this is the periodicity or this is the value after which the structure is repeating itself in this direction. Then as you see here in the typical wave pattern this distance and this distance are typically going to be the same. So, almost the wave will take the same type of uh, periodicity or the same type of wavelength as the distance between the scatterers. So, if A equals to distance between scatterers in a direction then the lambda in that direction will be the lambda of the block wave created in that structure will be same as whatever is the periodicity or the distance between the scatterers. So, some of the properties that uh, of these block waves are that first of all these block waves are quantized and they exist as discrete orthogonal modes and these are called as block modes. And they must have the same periodicity as the periodic crystal this is what I already discussed. And another property is that the acoustic intensity of the lowest order mode it must reside in the acoustically denser region or the region with higher acoustic impedance. So, based on these properties how do we say that there will be a band gap. So, let us say we have a periodic this is a one dimensional uh, sonic crystal. So, this is a 1 d sonic crystal. 
this thing is a 1D sonic crystal and this is the thickness or the diameter for a sonic scatterer, this is the spacing and here the lattice constant is actually the distance between the centers of the two adjacent scatterers, this is the lattice constant, the weight is defined. So, let us say the mode 1 is created, now we know that the property of the block wave is that the lowest order mode or the mode 1 it must have its, uh, it must reside the nodes, the anti nodes of which or the maxima of it must reside in the acoustically denser region. So, what you will see here is that the points are in the uh, scatterers. So, the maxima occurs at the center of the scatterers. Then we have a block mode 2 and because the two modes are going to be orthogonal to each other. So, this here minima happens here and maxima happens in the lighter region. Now, if you see here then the proper then any wave that is created in this structure it will have the same wavelength the same period the same spatial periodicity as the periodicity of this structure. So, the wavelength will be the same for both the waves and it will be given by the periodicity of the structure. So, if you see here the structure repeats itself after every a units which can also be given as if this is d by 2 this is d by 2. So, d by 2 plus s plus d by 2 which gives you capital which gives you d plus s ok this is. So, this is d by 2 this is d by 2. So, d by 2 plus s plus d by 2 is the distance after which the periodicity repeats or the pattern repeats. So, the wavelengths they will be same as this particular thing. So, the wavelength of these block waves will be same. So, which means that 2 pi by lambda is same because lambda is same. So, the wave number is going to be same. Now, as you see I already explained to you the why maxima happens in here dense region and here in the th uh, thinner region. Now, we know that the acoustic energy it is proportional to the amplitude of the wave, but it is inversely proportional to the impedance and here the scatterer has a much higher acoustic impedance compared to the thin fluid medium. So, as you can see here, here p is maximum, but in that case the, the impedance is very very high. So, p square, so in that case the overall acoustic intensity for this one the energy will be lower compared to the energy of the higher mood. So, therefore, the intensity of the two moods are going to be different. So, when the intensity of the two moods are different, so which means that if we take if we average out we take the average RMS quantities then it can be represented as P RMS 1 square by rho 1 C 1. Here these are the average density and the average speed of sound. So, these are not going to be same. So, when they are not same which means that now for the because it is the same wave and it has the same wave form the P RMS is the same. And because for this per if you take this arrangement or the crystal and you find out the average density. So, both waves are occurring in the same periodic structure. So, the average density is also the same, but the energy modes are different. So, what it means is that that this is same this is same which means that the speed of sound in the two for the two waves must be different. So, the speed of sound of the two waves must be different which means the frequency of the two sounds must be different. Why? Because <coughs> c is equal to uh, lam f into lambda, f is omega by 2 pi into lambda frequency into wavelength. Lambda is same, but c is different. So, which means omega must be different. So, what we get here is that for this for all this theorem to be valid and the properties to be valid all the block moods they must have different frequencies. So, whenever any wave is created the frequency of one will always be different than the frequency of the second wave and so on. So, the frequencies are always discrete and separate and hence there is always some gap and these gaps in the frequencies are called as the frequency bands and it is those small gaps over which there is no wave propagation and that is called as the band gaps. So, now that you have understood this principle of band gap, we will study about local resonance in the next class. Thank you.